So what makes Santa Cruz here so special is that it's more than just a program, it's actually a platform. This platform with corporate partners, universities, regulators, and also startups makes the difference in healthcare and digital healthcare today. In the startup career sphere, we look for business problems from our teams internally, and then we look for the best startups in the world that can solve us uh, these business problems together with us. And so we bring them to Munich and then we co-create a solution and create opportunities for collaborations. The collaboration with uh, startups is essential because they are bringing us the applications we need in our open ecosystem. So they are the fuel that we can serve our customers with innovative solutions. Startup Prius here is a very interesting program and it's a super chance for startups to eventually get access to key players, to, to technical experts, to stuff within the Rush entity and have the chance to really speak to the right people at the right time. Without Startup Creosphere, we as a company, we would have never come as far as where we are now. And without Startup Creosphere, we would have never had these partnerships to Roche, to customers, to other innovative companies. So Startup Creosphere was the nucleus for us as a company to experience digital healthcare to experience digital diagnostics and to understand this market we are now operating in. Hello everybody. If we can please ask you to take a seat, there are lots of empty seats all around. Don't be shy, come closer. There are more seats on the left if you would like to see the, the angle from here um, and we would like to kick it off. Yes, please make your way forward. All right, let's kick it off. Welcome everybody to the second part of our Munich Summit and our expo from Startup Creosphere, our digital healthcare platform. My name is Friederike Rohr, I'm head of the Munich office and also the director of the Startup Creosphere program. And it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you all here today. Familiar faces, new faces, people from the healthcare ecosystem that bring us here all together. So let's see again, as, you said, as I said already, this is the second part of the summit this afternoon. Yesterday we started with an exclusive day zero event for our corporate partners, followed by the intertech part this morning, and now the healthcare portion. So we welcome you for this. But before we kick it off, a couple of points on the agenda, some housekeeping rules, some points of entertainment. Um, so we're starting with the opening remarks, followed by a new partner announcement that we're having here today, followed by the pilot showcases. So the startups will be presenting together with the business units what they have achieved throughout this program, where today we really have the final of this program. And first we start with Biotronic, our corporate partner, and then followed by um, a keynote by our unicorn portfolio company, Okin and then followed by the Roche Pilot Showcases. And then, of course, there will be a Best Pilot Award, so always have your phone ready for some voting. And um, here are some housekeeping rules. Um, so we have a long, extensive networking place. We Please, please use the break for it. And um, also the acoustic in this room is really bad, so everyone who's in the back, come and take a seat or go to the networking area. Um, both is equally fine. Um, just so you know, and the Munich room is always open. We have good demo booth stands there with other exciting startups that you can always meet there. So I said we have some event highlights and entertainment here today. Um, so of course the networking, but that's up to you how entertaining that will be. Followed by the best startups, of course. We have the demo booth stands as mentioned, and tonight we will have a cocktail bar, we have a DJ, so please do stay for our big celebration afterwards. And there's also going to be a comedian here in the evening uh, for some extra fun. 
We also have a booth stand here on the left. Please make use of it for your social media channels. Feature us on LinkedIn. Share what your experiences you had here today. It's always great to see and um, make use of that with new people that you meet and um, yeah, enjoy the networking together. Before that, another point that we will also bring up later again, we have a special feature here today, it's called Bingo. We all know Bingo, but it will be a networking Bingo. So you all can receive little papers in the entrance that you should, and you have to answer certain questions and you have to do a little bit of challenges. So you need a business card, you need to talk to one person you never spoke to before, because in networking it often comes that you only talk to the people that you already know, and we want to change this today. So follow all the steps, and if you have achieved it, hand it in. And there is a special prize today, which will be a meeting with our CEO, Zaid Amidi. So for anyone, that might be really interesting. Um, so make use of it and tick the boxes. But now let's talk a little bit about plug and play and startup Creosphere and why we are here today. So you probably all know the story of the lucky building and how it all started, but now actually plug and play is the biggest innovation platform globally. We have over 50 locations around the globe and we are the most active VC in early stages. Last year we have done over 250 investments alone and we are growing continuously. So we are really the platform for everything that has to do with startups and corporate partners. But Startup Creosphere is our digital healthcare platform that we launched here in Munich five years ago with our dear founding partner Roche Diagnostics and we're actually celebrating our anniversary in June as well together. And the goal of this exclusive program is really to pilot. So you will see this today, the pilot so showcases. So what it's really about is the tangible outcome of the collaboration between startups and corporates. But of course, we facilitate networking, we have matchmaking sessions, and we have done this over the past years very successfully. And here you can also see some stats. Exactly, first. We will talk about our corporate partners. I've already mentioned Roche Diagnostics, but with us on the platform, we have Daichi Sankyo, we have Biotronic, we have BIX, we have our new partner here today, Neom and Accenture. And together, thank you for your trust. It's our mission to really transform healthcare with the startups and the business units from the corporate partners. We are a global company and also Startup Creosphere is growing with different locations. We are currently in three locations in Silicon Valley, Singapore and Munich and we are growing continuously and also within the healthcare space generally we are spread all around the world. This is going to be the 10th batch starting soon, so we are in the 9th batch and we had over 100 pilot projects in the past five years which is very impressive. And throughout these programs, we had over 500 matchmaking sessions, over 70 events in Munich alone, such this one today. And yeah, we're looking forward what will happen next. And how do these pilot projects actually come all together? It's actually a long iterative process between the business units from our corporate partners who are also here today, together with the startups from the program. And together with our ventures team from Plug and Play, we look for really the right startup to make the business units needs successful. So it's a concrete use case that is business critical. And then we look in an iterative process to find the right startup to then be invited to our kickoff to kick off this program. And today is actually the end of this program, the big expo where we celebrate our successes and the teams will show what they have worked on together. We call them pilot projects and pilot owners, but actually yesterday one of the pilot owners told me, no, no, I'm not a pilot owner, these are my friends. And of course that's the best success that we can think about, that it's a collaboration on eye level and um, yeah, that lead to friendships and long-term goals. These are the startups from the current program. The topics are advanced data analytics, digital biomarkers, clinical decision support, disease management and digital service solutions. And it's an international cohort and we even have two startups from our US program joining us today. It will be a hybrid event, so we also have an audience virtually dialed in, so hello to you as well. And some of the startups will also be pitching virtually. So these are the pilot projects that you will be seeing today. And of course, always use the breaks in the evening to meet them in person and to ask all the questions that you might have. And with this, let's kick it off. 
we have an announcement to make and for this I would like to invite our newest partner Neum to the platform bringing a completely new angle to what we do. I would like to ask Jordan Salmon to join me on stage and then we can talk about um, what Neum is going to do with Startup Creosphere in the next program. Big round of applause for Jordan, please. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Jordan Selman. I'm the head of health partnerships and innovation with Neom. And uh, very excited to be here today. As we said, we're the newest partner to the startup Creosphere ecosystem. And uh, thank you very much to Roche, to uh, Biotronic, uh, Accenture, BIX, um, Dashi Sanko, uh, Plug and Play, of course, uh, for having us here. And we're excited to be part of this. Uh, by means of introduction, we'd like to speak to you today about Neom, about who we are, about what we're doing, and it's usually very good to start out with uh, a video so that we can set the stage and get everybody on the same page. So, quick video on what Neom is. Neom is real. The future of work, living, and sustainability is coming to life. The master plan is being realized more every day. A project unique in scale, already being built in a place with 95% of land protected for nature, where rewilding is in motion, bringing animals back to their natural habitat. Our luxury island destination, Sindala, has launched as has Trojena, our mountain destination, the Lime, our flagship city, and our center for advanced industries, Oxygen. Things are changing fast. In 2022, we launched companies, including Tonimus, our world-leading tech and digital enterprise, and Enoa, responsible for managing Neom's first-class sustainable energy and water systems, featuring the world's largest green hydrogen production plant. This progressive stance is why we invested $175 million in Volocopter, the next generation of transport. It's why some 200,000 people are expected to attend the captivating exhibitions for the line. It's why athletes from 25 countries participated in the Neon Beach Games. And it's why the planet's fastest growing lifestyle brand, Ennismore, has become the first hotel partner for Trojena. Already, Saudia offers direct flights from Neon to London and Dubai. Our media sector has supported 25 productions in 18 months, working with names such as the BBC, Apple TV, and NBC. Neom has partnered with McLaren to drive innovation and talent development in electric motorsport. We joined Ocean X to discover and protect the secrets hidden at the bottom of the Red Sea. With the Asian Football Confederation, we launched the Shahab Community Program to develop the next generation of Saudi footballing talent. Trojana has been awarded the Asian Winter Games in 2029, and there is so much more to come. We can elevate life because we have a blank canvas. This is not business as usual. This is the new future. This is Neom. Visit neom.com. Thank you. I did not make that video, so no applause necessary. But as we said, Neom is tackling the challenges that we're facing as a, society, as a health industry, and we're tackling the challenges that we're facing as a society. We, we all know that change is hard. We know transformation is hard. Getting from point A to point B, even if we know the solution, it's not easy to get there. It's like a Rubik's Cube. You can start moving it all around and you get to green on one side and you think you're done, change it to the other side, there's a lot left to go. So Neom came from Vision 2030 in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is the National Transformation Program to diversify the economy, 
diversify uh, society, open up the, uh, the, the country. And during that process, it was targets were, were put forward to become a leader in the world. And they said, well, how do we go beyond that? How do we do better than that? And the answer was, you start from scratch. You have to go from, you get rid of the, the legacy systems. So if you get rid of all of the, all, all of the challenges that we already have, and then you have an opportunity to, to rebuild that, you can start to redefine our livability. You can redefine business, and you can redefine conservation to start tackling some of the largest challenges that we have. And in that blank slate, we've developed, uh, we're, we're organized across 14 economic sectors, which are the sectors that you'd find in most any society, energy, water, food, health, well-being, and biotech. And each one of those, we started with a strategy to design everything across the entire ecosystem so that they work together and were fully integrated. So we developed the, the strategies, the governance, how we organize, how we're resourced, both people, technology, our processes, and chief amongst this, we put health in all policies. So from the designs of the cities to be walkable, to the uh, ensuring that uh, everything's made to be fostering uh, mental health, it was, uh, we, we, we've, we've moved forward to offering our vision within the, the health sector, which is to become a benchmark for the world for its unique in ecosystem through the use of innovative designs and technologies. So if we look at this, our vision is really to become a, a living lab. We have this legacy-free system which allows us to design and build a new future. And in order to do that, we need to bring in partners to help looking through this, identify what's the next best thing, what, how would we do things differently. And you all know what the challenges are. You face them every day. You're out here trying to solve those challenges in the, in the systems that you work within. Now, if we give you the opportunity to say, if you could even go beyond that and do something different. Many of you have probably started working on something and you run into one wall or another wall or another wall before you can finally figure out the solution that's going to work. Now, what we offer is that, that blank canvas. We offer that opportunity for you to say, well, let's redesign it in a different way. So we give you that unique is ecosystem to help solving the challenges that you have and that you face. Chief amongst these challenges, there's three million preventable diseases in OECD countries, in the developed world. So that's three million people that died that didn't have to if we just followed normal prevention. 1.9 million of those people died because they did not have, uh, because they didn't have, uh, that could have been solved with normal primary care or public health measures. One million of those individuals would have been saved if there were more timely interventions. And the, we, within the systems, we see that life expectancy has been growing and we should celebrate the successes over the last 50 years, but it's become stagnant. And just life expectancy isn't really what the goal should be because if you're spending extra time, but the time is in the hospital, is that really how you want to spend those extra years? So we're looking to narrow the gap between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. So it's keeping the individuals healthy for as long as possible. And recent surveys of health systems have said that 40% of, uh, of primary care interventions could be done virtually. So that's 40% of, of primary care facilities that might not need to be used. That's 40% of that population of 3 million that could be reached and treated. And additionally, the health industry have surveyed have said that 50% think that the integration of lifestyle trackers and monitoring and real-time monitoring would be beneficial for primary care. So NEOM's looking to shift the paradigm from sick care to health maintenance. And how do we do that? So we're looking at population health at the individual level. 
to devolve the point of care as close to the individual as possible, to start layering all these bits of technology, all of these things that we know work on top of each other to start preventing an individual from ever getting sick. So if we take a, uh, and a lot of this is actually um, available today, and we focus on the wider determinants of health. So it's not just your clinical information. It's how do we leverage genomic information? How do we leverage general lifestyle and behavior? Uh, environment and social. And uh, some of the other uh, socioeconomic uh, determinants of health. Layer all of those together, bring care closer to the individuals, start preventing what's wrong, then you end up reducing the number of primary care facilities because you can deliver the care at home, which means you can deliver more acute services in those primary care facilities, which means you need less hospitals. Less hospitals, less brick and mortar facilities means less capital expenditures. It means less operational expenditures. It means more money that can be put back into system to research, to maintenance of, of healthy lifestyles. And we intend to do this through a fully integrated uh, system. So I, I said a lot of this is already uh, available today. If you look at, uh, you take your health track or your monitor, some of the imaging technologies that we can use on your phone to give your blood pressure. And if you just think of it as a quick visit, you see that you have high blood pressure. The doctor uh, virtually gives you a call. They say, well, we think you need this medication. So you can go to the store quickly, get the medication. And after a couple of days, you usually can see if it's working or not. So they can then calibrate whether you need more or less, and then adjust your prescription. A Couple days later, maybe it's more or less. And then you end up targeting down to the exact amount that the individual needs, so they don't have to take extra medications or less medications. And this is all done through continuous monitoring and adjustments to your, uh, your, your health, um, uh, adjustments to medications. Now that's all available today, so how will we take this to, to, to the, next, the next stage? Well, to start with, we're building a digital health backbone. This is a fully integrated system that takes the multiple determinants of health, the multiple areas of data, and it standardizes that data, it normalizes that data, and puts it in a centralized repository uh, or federated repository so that you have normalized data from genomics, from lifestyle trackers, from clinical data, the notes, the forms are all put in the same place. You can start layering all kinds of very interesting analytics on top of that. And we're delivering this now. We just announced our partnerships with Microsoft, Palantir, Innovacer, and PwC are helping us, Harvard, Joslin as well, are helping us to, to build this, and we're launching the proof of concept later this month. So we're building the digital backbone and we're connecting through the rest of the world. We said virtual care. So this is partnerships with virtual care facilities. Cleveland Clinic launched an EICU across town in Cle Cleveland over a decade ago. Did improved health outcomes. Emory University out of Georgia is providing uh, the EICU from Perth, Australia. So it's a global economy now. We can democratize the health workforce and we can um, enable the, a virtual community to help to solve some of these problems for an individual at the individual level. So this truly go global network is not just us. This is all of you in the room. These are the big partners, our, our friends at, at BIX and Roche, who are going to help in, in design some of this. We mentioned some of the technology companies. And it's also all the startups. And we welcome you guys to come and work with us. We welcome you to this new future. Help us design this together. And that's why we're here today. That's why we're a member of Startup Creesphere. That's why we would like to partner with all of you, to hear your ideas, because I'm here to listen to learn from your experiences, to learn what you can offer, 
and to see how we might be able to work together to build a new future together. So thank you very much, and I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. A big round of applause for Jordan, and we are very excited uh, for Neum to join. Um, Neum will bring a very new angle to what we have done so far in, on our healthcare platform. And um, yeah, we're excited for the projects that will come. Definitely a big opportunity for many startups also here today. Let's jump right into it. First session of startups. And um, we have um, Christina with us here today, our senior program manager, and she will be guiding you through this part. Big round of applause for Christina. Thank you. Welcome also from my side. Um, pleasure to um, have you all here with us today. Uh, my name is Christina Brandmeier, Senior Program Manager of our Startup Creosphere program. And yeah, it's always super exciting to see um, the whole success of a program coming into place at the Expo Day to see and showcase um, the pilot projects that were running throughout the last three to four months and to see finally um, the teams on stage showcasing what they have been working on. For whom is it the first expo um, at Startup Creosphere? Hands up. Oh, I see a lot of new people in the room. Um, who has been here many times? Also a lot of people. <laughs> Especially our partners here in the front rows. Um, a special welcome also from my side to all of you. It's really exciting. Um, to be hosting this. And also from my side, a welcome to our virtual audience. Um, so let's get started. Um, it's really time to come to the core of our event. So at this Expo 9, we will showcase the teams and all the batch startups that um, have, been working on to, have been working together over the past um, months um, to give them the chance to share insights on their pilot projects. And I'm really beyond excited to get to know um, all of them and explore the great work. And if my team can switch to the next slides, perfect. We have some special effects prepared for, for you. So we asked each team to think of a phrase for their collaboration and to use AI art to make this visible to our audience. So um, here you can see an example of an astronaut riding a horse in the style of for, for instance, Andy Warhol. So um, stay tuned for some special effects in the pilot showcases. And also, there will be a little bit of work for all of you. Um, at the end of the event, we will be giving um, an award to the best um, pilot team. So um, all of you will have the chance to choose the winner of the best pilot showcase. Make sure to listen to the pitches extra carefully. And with that, let's start off with the showcase of our Biotronic pilot project. So our dear partner Biotronic um, is a healthcare company that specializes in cardiovascular and endovascular medical technologies. Um, they are finding new solutions for people with heart and blood vessel, vessel uh, diseases to live healthy and fulfilling lives. Um, back in October, they selected three teams um, for, for projects during batch nine. And I still remember when we announced these projects in, in October, um, so like last time, I would like to welcome on stage Alexandra Stoll, uh, Manager Business Strategy Cardiac Rhythm Management at Biotronic. Um, show, show us some um, round of applause, please. So, ah, the microphone is working, perfect. So yeah, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to represent Biotronic today and to talk about the achievements that we had during the Startup Creosphere program, so this batch nine, and also um, yeah, what we have done so far besides the Startup Creosphere program. Um, this batch nine, um, we changed the whole scope of the Startup Creosphere program internally at Biotronic. When we first started um, as a partner in the program, we tried to focus on our product innovations. And um, for batch nine, we expanded the scope and thus also 
move towards process innovations, which is why we added one layer to the whole Startup Creosphere program and um, yeah, had more function within the company joining the whole program. This is why this batch we also worked on three very interesting pilot projects which you will hear shortly. So the first one was focusing on supply planning, trying to find a better solution in order to um, reduce the whole heavy workload that we experienced in the forecasting. A second pilot project we focused on the production, finding a new coding solution in order to move from a rather batch-like process to a process that can be carried out in a one-piece flow. And um, third, we also focused on the carbon management side, so trying to really specifically and in detail determine the CO2 footprint of our products in order to include this into our external reporting. But nonetheless, even though in this batch we focused on process innovations, we have been quite busy internally, of course, on the product innovations, which is why we, of course, have been working on new implants and also improved our patient app, which is why I'm very um, yeah, excited to announce that we have several new product launches coming up this year in each of our main business units. So for example, in um, our cardiac rhythm management unit, we are launching a new pacemaker, a new defibrillator lead, a new function to our patient app, and um, our new generation implantable cardiac monitor, which is our Biomonitor 4. Then also in our vascular intervention unit, we are also launching new products within each of our um, specialties. So for um, coronary and also for peripheral interventions, we're launching two new products each, a multifunctional kit, a resorbable magnesium stent, and also expanding our um, specialized offer with an IMDS partnership. And then most exciting for us this year is that we are entering a new um, market and um, yeah, expanding into the neuromodulation space and launching here a spinal cord stimulation device, which yeah, we're very much looking forward to. And since we have um, such a variety of new product launches planned for this year, we unfortunately are also um, yeah, skipping the Startup Creosphere pilot project since we have to focus on all of those product launches that we have internally as well as the pilot projects which are still ongoing and um, yeah, developing into really full scope, scope uh, collaborations internally. But nonetheless, I would like to take the time today to recap a bit what we have done so far and what kind of successes we had with the program. So when we started um, as a partner in the Startup Creosphere program, one goal that we had, or actually the main goal in the beginning was to reduce our not invented here syndrome since Biotronic um, has a very long history for um, 60 years of bringing our um, own product innovations to the market. But we have been we are rather hesitant to get into external collaborations, which is why we joined the Startup Creosphere program in order to initiate a shift in mindset. And I think we have been quite successful internally since we had many colleagues joining the Startup Creosphere program either as pilot owner or in different functions. And uh, yeah, one of those colleagues, for example, was um, someone with experience at Biotronic for 20 years. And um, yeah, she was extremely surprised how quick we can actually set up those um, contracts and get everything running in order to really start into these pilot projects. Um, further, we also improved the cross-functional collaboration with the program and, of course, within each of them we had a very high learning curve. And for 
at the, I think in total, um, nine pilot projects with one additional project that we've carried out before we joined um, the program as a partner. We were able to reach over 50 colleagues internally and build very long lasting and great um, partnerships with our startups. Uh, yeah, if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me online or today um, personally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. Uh, very amazing to see your development over the past years and how many um, internal um, stakeholders are involved and the commitment you showed and the development you made over the years. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, overall, today we will have 10 pilot showcases. Imagine, it's, it's a huge number, a, a crazy success. We're very proud on this. So what does this actually mean? Prior to the program, we actually received 10 focus topics from our corporate partners. Um, we scouted a lot of startups globally and selected the perfect match startup for each corporate challenge. Um, so for each project, there is always a business unit and a startup that will today together present um, their success on stage. So as Startup Greasefield is also a very global program, um, you see a lot of people joining here on site with us today, but of course a few speakers will also join us virtually or they have sent um, a video message um, to be part of this event. So jumping right into the first topic um, from Biotronic um, on the focus topic insulating coating, where Biotronic selected the company Medical Surface um, that is developing innovative surface coating technologies for implanted or variable medical devices and biosensors. So for this um, pilot showcase, um, we will first see a recording of the pilot owner and then Kevin will join us virtually. So let's jump right into it. Hello everyone, I'm Martin Bummer and I would like to present. Hello Maybe we everyone. can check the sound. I would like to present Biotronic <laughs> Challenge Insulated Coat Process. With this challenge, we want to identify insulated coat solutions that can be run on the globe. So, in the background, there's been some insulated coat on the mountain devices. Um, these coat solutions not only have to be insulated, they are also accessible to medical environments and uh, they are mostly biocode. Currently, we are in the current process. That process is uh, a quite small bench size, twelve hours. So uh, we would like to replace that. So our challenge is to find a protein that has similar characteristics as the current process, but but is reliable in line. That means we should be able to integrate it in an automated. To adapt to the short project time, um, we want to focus on the insulation and mechanical properties like each And now we will keep on with the printer. Okay, let's see if our virtual speaker is on the line. Kevin, can you hear me? Yeah, I can see you already, and I guess uh, you will share your own screen. Wonderful. Um, please go go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Martin, for the excellent introduction, uh, and thank you to the Chris Fear uh, organizers. My company, Medical Surface is fortunate to be selected as a partner of Biotronic for this exciting project. This is an AI art generated for this project. We asked the AI to draw a picture of scientists coating pacemaker, and this is what we got. A gigantic heart with a pacemaker inside, and a couple of scientists are using a paintbrush and a large sponge to coat the implanted device. I can assure you that this is not the way we code implanted medical devices. 
But I think the AI is very artistic and very funny. Okay, this picture is not as good as the AI art. It shows that we are coding many different types of medical devices, such as contact lenses, cardiovascular devices, glucose sensors, and catheters. Here are some general information about medical service. We are a medical device coating service provider established since 2011, we are ISO 13485 certified. We have GMP clean room coating operation and customized coating process IND. We are headquartered in Massachusetts, USA, and we are a member of a Harvard launch lab. We use a variety of coating technologies, including deep coating, spray coating, plasma coating, and other technologies. And for each medical device, we will customize our coating technology, coating process, and coating materials to meet the requirements specified by the customer. These are some examples of our coating products. We have hydrophilic coatings to make the surface hydrophilic, which means easy to be wetted by water. These coatings can be applied on contact lenses, for example. We have lubricious coatings to make surface slippery, which is important for catheters, for example, to move inside the body without too much friction. We have biocompatible coatings to help medical devices interact better with surrounding tissues when they're implanted. We have superhydrophobic and superhydrophilic coatings for a variety of applications. And we have coatings specifically designed for biosensors, including glucose sensors. Our business model includes coating development, coating service, and we also do technical transfer. We have a wonderful experience working with Martin Boris and Ian at Biotronic during this project. Although we communicate only through video conference, I feel like we're working together side by side. We have established a very good collaboration. The coding thickness has met the requirements. In the first batch of coding trials, we got very good initial results. However, the in vitro storage showed a significant decrease in impedance and adhesion. In the second batch of coating trials, we tested different coating parameters and got much better adhesion and impedance after in vitro storage. Further improvement is still needed. In the next steps, we'll keep on working together in the same manner to optimize the coating when the coating meets all the requirements, we'll start a deeper collaboration. Thank you very much for your attention. Perfect. Kevin, I hope you were able to hear the big round of applause from our audience on site. Everyone, uh, please get in touch with the startup. Um, and um, thank you, Kevin, for joining us virtually. Um, so that was one project of Biotronic of this current batch, very close to their core business. And for the second one, um, we're going a bit more into the sustainability direction. So as Alexandra mentioned, it's, um, we have very different topics. So the second one is on carbon management. Um, so for the second topic, they selected Circular Tree, um, a startup that is also very well known at Plug and Play because they were already part of our startup Autobahn program in the mobility sector uh, in Stuttgart. Um, and the company enables um, other companies to achieve net zero uh, emissions. So let's start with the business unit perspective. Um, again, a recording from Neil Sasnik, um, consultant uh, in the area of sustainability and reporting at Biotronic. And then we will hear um, a speaker live on stage. Um, perfect. Let's go ahead. Hello, everyone. 
My name is Neil Zaslank. I'm responsible for Biotronic Sustainability Reporting, and I've been participating in the Creosphere Carbon Management Project in collaboration with our partner startup, Circular Tree. The project team has been working together over the last few months to analyze the carbon footprint of one of our medical devices. As you probably know, it's becoming increasingly important to know exactly what carbon footprint a company is creating. That's why we wanted to take a closer look at the carbon footprint of our products and perhaps even identify potential savings and further optimization of the opportunities. As the accurate analysis of medical products is complex and time-consuming and requires close cooperation with suppliers, we are glad that the Circular Tree supported us with a strong knowledge of carbon management and the Circular, team, Circular Tree team will now show you in detail the steps we have taken and what we have achieved together in this project. Enjoy it. Thank you so much, Neil. Big round of applause for the business unit perspective. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Gunther from Circular Tree. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much, Christina. Yeah, really feels great to be in front of so many innovation minded people. Uh, my name is Gunther. I'm the co founder and CEO of Circular Tree. What are we doing? We're a software as a solution provider and we help manufacturing companies to calculate and exchange supply chain carbon emissions. So ask yourself, why are we doing this? Well, you're all aware about the 1.5 climate target. And in order to achieve this, all companies must work towards decarbonization. The challenge is companies need to be able to measure their improvements and they want to gain a competitive advantage out of this. And this is why we are tracking the product carbon footprint through the supply chain and enable companies to decarbonize and to eventually get net zero. So then you might ask yourself, healthcare industry, how much is the carbon footprint? Actually, it's 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions come from the healthcare industry. And in the past, there has not been much focus on it, but in the recent years, there are more and more regulations towards decarbonizing the healthcare industry. And in this regard, we were very happy when we were approached by Biotronic to work on a sustainable pacemaker. And here you will find the nice illustration from the AI, how they think a sustainable pacemaker looks like. Now, before we go into the project, some very few basics. Why is a product carbon footprint so important? It is important because it's the only measurement which really gives you the impact of a product on the climate based or independent of the business model. All other company carbon footprints really um, don't have much meaning. Important is the product carbon footprint in the end. And based on the product carbon footprints, more and more conscious customers make purchasing decisions. They really want to enable um, the decarbonization of their own supply chains or private consumers wants to do this but also investors are increasingly focusing on sustainable companies and they want to see companies having a strong agenda and actionable items to really decarbonize uh, their supply chains. The challenge of the product carbon footprint is what you see here. Only on average 20% come from the own company, 80% of the product carbon footprint comes from the supply chain, and the supply chain can be fairly complex. And this is why up to date there has been no solution to really efficiency, efficiently um, decarbonize the supply chain. And that's why we have invented our real key to success process to decarbonize supply chain. We start with uploading the bill of material, then we calculate the product carbon footprint based on secondary database values. On this information, we find the carbon hotspots, 
and the components with the highest carbon footprint we put into our optimization cycle. And in this cycle, we have an exchange module which communicates with global standardized mechanisms from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Catena X, or Estanium, to really replace the secondary values with real primary data values from the real suppliers. And of course, if you have real values, you can talk with your supplier and tell them, look, um, we're at 10 kilogram maybe today, let's develop a plan on how we get to zero over the next 10 years. And this plan is then automatically tracked by our software and you can continuously review the results on our dashboard. Now we started this process with Biotronic and here you can see the results on the customized components. And what you can easily see on this graphic is that the housing and the battery are the carbon hotspots of these components. So these are the two components you would focus on first to really decarbonize this pacemaker. What are the next steps? We want to complete the carbon footprint calculation with Biotronic and we want to onboard the suppliers to really set up reduction targets and in the end we will have a dashboard as you can see it below where Biotronic can regularly review the progress in getting um, the solution and of course the collaboration with Biotronic. So last but not least for the Biotronic section, we have one more project to go and it's on the focus topic demand prediction analysis. So what does that mean? Um, it, um, Flowlity, the company that was selected by Biotronic, they develop AI forecasting algorithms and I'm curious how together with Biotronic they implemented this uh, to use AI for better forecasting. So um, we will start with the virtual presentation by the pilot owner, Gregor Kirchner. Can you hear me, Gregor? Do. Can you hear me? Yes. You can. Great. You can hear me? Okay, perfect. Then go ahead. Stage is yours. Okay, I will share my presentation. Hopefully you can see it. Yes. Yes, um, as you have already inter introduced, um, we, uh, yeah, our project was about uh, the demand prediction analytics. So maybe a few, a few words uh, to my person. Uh, I'm responsible for the demand planning at Biotronic for the business units CRM and uh, Neuro, which uh, Alexandra has already presented a couple of minutes ago. Um, so here's our AI um, painting. So as you can see, we were looking for um, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, creating a demand forecast, and uh, we put this in the style of Claude Monet. Yeah, so um, regarding our project, um, we wanted to make use of advanced analytics to reduce the workload and improve our forecast accuracy. So uh, at Biotronic, we have a monthly rolling demand planning process. Uh, which is characterized by a huge workload, especially in the sales force, uh, but also here in our headquarters. So uh, we have uh, 650 plus materials that have to be forecasted each month for the next 18 months. Um, why 18 months? Uh, because we have a very long supply chain, long lead times, um, even before Corona. And as you all know, uh, Corona made it all worse. And that's why we need this uh, very long time horizon for forecasting. Um, the challenge is that, uh, as already mentioned, the workload is um, very high, especially in sales, as we have a decentralized manual planning process. So that means that everyone is entering uh, the data manually each month into, in, into our tools. Um, and on the other hand, our forecast accuracy is quite good. But uh, of course, there's always room for improvement, uh, especially when you look into the midterm horizon. So the goal uh, of the collaboration was to reduce the manual workload significantly to optimize forecasting to a certain degree, so wherever, uh, whatever is possible, and to, of course, keep or even increase our forecast accuracy in the midterm horizon. Um, and last but not least, uh, to visualize the impact on the stock optimization. 
Um, yeah, we had a very uh, close collaboration, very positive collaboration with Flowlity, especially with uh, Frank and Mathieu. And uh, having said this, I would like to hand over to Frank um, presenting the resu results of our project. Thank you, Gregor. You did my job and introduced Frank already. Uh, go ahead, uh, Frank. From Hello, Flowlity. everybody. How are you doing? Doing okay? Okay, I'm going to be here for the next uh, four minutes, which is a bit of a challenge to summarize in four minutes what we did in two months, but I'm sure I'm going to succeed. So, I mean, the, the, whole, um, what, uh, the, whole, the, the whole idea when we took on this challenge was to try and help uh, Biotronic to improve the forecast accuracy, uh, reduce the workload, the burden of the workload of doing the forecasting process worldwide, and uh, before I actually give you the results, but I'm pretty sure that you want to see, make sure, did we succeed or did we not succeed? I'm just going to give a few, um, a few, there we go, uh, just a few, a little background about Flowlity. So Flowlity, what do we do? Actually, we're a, we're a SaaS platform and we help manufacturers to face volatility. So on the demand side, on the supply side. This is our core, this is our core, core business. Now the question is, how do we do this? Okay. So we've, uh, in, we've encompassed in our solution a number of innovations which actually help us do this. So obviously the forecasting side is number one. So we've encompassed artificial intelligence at the forecasting level, which today the benefit is that we're able to uh, outperform the standard algorithms and market AI algorithms by 10, 20%. So this is number one. Number two, what we do is that we also have integrated artificial intelligence on the replenishment side. Why, why do we do this? We do this because the idea was to, to, to say, how can we kill the bullwhip MRP effect? Okay, this is sort of very important. When, when you do your forecasting, it's all very fine. You've got beautiful figures. You do your replenishment and you have a bullwhip effect. So what we do, we combine um, the forecasting and the replenishment together in order to, to kill the bullwhip effect. And then obviously we've added a number of additional, I would say, um, innovations, which I'm not gonna probably go through. It's probably too lengthy for today, um, but what you want to see is this, okay? So we worked two months with Biotronic, and as uh, Gregor said, I mean, it's a, it's a great team to work with. Um, the challenge that Biotronic has explained is actually a pretty tough challenge. Um, so they have um, a high number of SKUs. They have also a team uh, which is there on the supply and planning side. They have also data analysts to help them. So for us, the challenge was actually pretty strong. So after two months, this is what we achieved. On the forecast error side, we managed to reduce the, uh, the forecast error by 28%, which is not bad. What do you think? What do you think? Come on, don't be shy. Yes, good, well done, very good. Okay, second but not least, I mean, what's important to, um, to remember is that we did this using, I would say, a light version of Flowlity. Uh, the reason is that we wanted to produce quick results in a short period of time, which we did. And if we were to use the standard solution, which embeds actually self-learning algorithms, the result you see here on, on, on screen would be much higher, okay? The second kiss call effect for uh, Flowity is that by, um, we actually looked at the SNOP process very in, in, in depth with the team, trying to understand where Flowity could replace uh, some of the uh, manual or I would say semi-automated steps of the uh, SNOP process. And the outcome of this is that just by doing, I would say, a quick survey, we managed to see that we could reduce um, the whole process by 36%, which is not bad. Again, what do you think about this? Yes, round of applause, thank you. <laughs> Last one, but not least, we're actually looking to at what would be the additional savings from, a, 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 I would say, an inventory point of view. Okay, it's all very good to do the forecasting, to reduce the workload, but what is the impact on your stock? Well, how do I actually make sure when I do my replenishment, I have all the necessary raw materials to be able to produce, what do I keep, where, what is the impact for my regions? How do I define what is gonna be the consumption in raw materials and semi-finished products and unfinished products according to the different channels I have, sales channels I have, okay? And on this, on this bit, well, this is something that we're gonna be conducting soon. We have already um, some ideas about the results, which I will not communicate now, but what you need to know is that the average for our existing customers of stock reduction is between 15 and 30% and sometimes even higher. As a case like Saint-Gobain we work with, they do 40%. I'm just going to skip this one. Okay. Now, something to remember <clears throat> is that um, from a workload perspective, if you try to reduce the workload 
um, for your processing, I would say, the, uh, for analyzing your sales and, re and reducing the, the workload for analyzing your sales and doing the predictions. If you co focus only on the, for on the forecast ability, the impact is not going to be as strong as if you do that on the forecast and on the in inventory planning side. If you combine both, the impact is much higher. So this is something to remember because the part of the optimization of the stock optimization bit is so high that you can actually automate a lot of the process by working by exceptions, meaning that when you transfer information to the planners about the disruptions, 70, 80% or 90% of those disruptions will be already filtered by the system. Okay, and this is the um, Sangerman case I just wanted to mention. Um, they've been working with us in the, the start of um, uh, the creation of uh, Floaty five years ago. We're still working there, and uh, this gives you an example of how basically uh, we can minimize stock levels, but also uh, increase the availability of components and raw materials, which is pretty important. So uh, I'm pretty much done. Just one little thing to remember. Well, our stand is over there, so pay us a visit, and above all, don't forget to vote for Floaty, 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 Floaty. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Second, how Okin is actually helping solve those issues and uh, what might be helpful for some of the startups uh, in, in this room, uh, what are Okin's key success factors? So, uh, traditional R&D process is an extremely expensive, uh, long process with very low chances of success. So it takes about 2.7 billion to develop a drug in oncology or immunology. And these costs are only going up every year. They're not going down, unfortunately. It takes about 13 years to develop uh, and bring drugs to the market. And unfortunately, the chances for success are extremely low. It's actually less than 10%. So why is it so? Why is it so complex, um, this process? So human body is extremely complex. Every second, 40,000 billion, billion chemical reactions are happening in the body. If we take DNA from the human cells, we string it together and we stretch this line, it will go to the sun and back 50 times. So human body is really producing and storing big data on enormous scale. What it means is that we, we need to find ways to actually use this data, to analyze this data for our own good. And speaking of why drugs fail, so targets often um, actually fail to convert to drugs. So at the moment, uh, disease biology is not very well understood often. Patient data is underutilized. Preclinical models are simplified versions of the human biology. And um, really the heterogeneity of the disease is not fully captured. So on the other hand, also drugs uh, responses vary from patient to patient. No two cancers are the same. No two patients are the same from environmental factors to genetics, we all are different. And this complicates finding effective treatments for patients. And also clinical trials are slow and expensive, so uh, unfortunately often they are poorly designed and recruitment is uh, not inclusive and there's, it's difficult to find signal among all of the noise in the data. So um, how does Okin can help and what is, how is Okin helping here? So in a one sentence, uh, Okin is a federated data platform to create accelerated data-driven drug discovery and development. I realize there are a lot of Ds in this sentence. Um, and in a nutshell, what we do is that we use AI to, uh, and apply it to improve drug discovery, accelerate clinical trials, and we also have diagnostics uh, solutions. Uh, a little bit more about Okin. So it was founded in 2016 by these two um, handsome gentlemen uh, that you can see on the slide. Uh, so Thomas Lozell, who is actually an assistant professor in clinical oncology, and uh, Jill Weinrieb, who is actually a professor in machine learning. And uh, we are now a unicorn, and we have raised over 300 million from uh, industry partners like Sanofi and BMS, as well as uh, venture pa uh, partners, including uh, Plug and Play. Uh, we create scientific impact uh, through uh, publications. So we have uh, 34 publications in uh, top peer-reviewed journals, such as Nature Medicine, Nature Communications. And we work with top uh, KULs, top doctors in their fields. They are on our advisory board and they work uh, on our projects uh, to help um, find uh, and help uh, find solutions. Right now we are about 300 uh, people in about seven countries and uh, mostly uh, data scientists, engineers um, and doctors. A little bit more about how we operate. So we use uh, multimodal and longitudinal patient data uh, that uh, we find through the network of hospitals and uh, research centers that we partner with. So Gustave Rossi, for example, so some of them we cannot name, unfortunately, but they are across uh, Europe and North America. And we work with top KULs in oncology to sometimes locate this data, sometimes they help us on the help us on the projects, 
And we access the data in what is especially very important for Europe um, and North America as well, in a completely GDPR compliant way, uh, which means that data never shares, uh, never is shared. And I'll explain about this later. And the data we use is fully multimodal, so clinical images, uh, molecular uh, data, and also I elaborate a, lot, a little bit about the importance of this a little bit later. And we use um, interpretable AI to drive value for partners and for patients. So we offer, um, as I mentioned, uh, accelerated clinical trials. We can help uh, pharma companies find drug targets as well as find new indications for existing drugs. And for patients, we are really at the core of uh, personalized medicine because we start with patients and we start with the patient data. So, So what is it, uh, why is data so unique and uh, patient data so unique and uh, what's so special about it? So one of the problems in the drug discovery and development is that typical approach is to use simplified model of human biology. As this doesn't capture the complexity of the human body, the complexity of cancers, especially since we focus on oncology. And uh, this then translates to failed clinical trials. And we believe that um, new subtypes of patients uh, can help discover biology that can impact the full dry, uh, drug uh, life cycle. So I can give an example of, um, um, of triple negative breast cancer. It's a rare uh, type of breast cancer that unfortunately has high metastatic potential and um, it's typically has poor prognosis and there are very limited uh, treatments available currently on the market. It's a family of diseases and uh, that's why some drugs fail to show efficacy as the impact is diluted into broader populations that doesn't respond. So really at Okin we use uh, multiple modalities of data. So we use typically available clinical histology, genomics, uh, so RNA sequencing, DNA sequencing data, spatialomics and single, single cell data to drive uh, AI powered subtyping of patients. And um, by doing that, we really f uh, look for drugs uh, for each patient, uh, having better outcomes as well as faster trials. Um, and what is another important um, uh, part of our value proposition is that so Okin integrates uh, horizontally and, and vertically with pharma companies uh, and we create value proposition for all of the throughout the value chain for them. So we have solutions uh, for discovery, we have solutions for clinical trial optimization as well as diagnostics. And in terms of the differentiating technologies, uh, so we have uh, two, I would say, that differentiate us um, among many other companies. So the first one is the federated uh, data network. Um, it's, it's very important, as I mentioned, uh, especially in, in Europe, was while uh, healthcare data is extremely sensitive and it's the most, the strictest regulations are applied to this type of data. So how we approach it is that since a foundation of the company in 2016, we uh, use federated learning to access the data. It never uh, leaves uh, hospitals. It never leaves uh, the research centers. It stays there behind the firewall firewalls. It's the algorithm that travels there, learns, and then goes back to the central hub. And an example of this project is a project called Melody, where 10 large pharma companies, uh, so uh, Amgen, Bayer, AstraZeneca, Novartis, they shared something very sensitive. Uh, and you can imagine how strict their compliance um, are in these companies. So they didn't really share, but our algorithm traveled to the databases of their uh, single cell data. Um, small molecule chemistry data to help predict 
um, a drug target affinity and screen through the libraries of molecules. Another um, component here is the interpretable AI. Our models are never black boxes. Our models, um, we can always go back to the finding and understand why something, why specific finding actually is related to uh, the prediction that the, that the model has made. So uh, it's something that's very unique. And since I mentioned we work with the top KURLs in oncology, we work hand in hand with them to find sometimes uh, f new features, new biomarkers that are associated with uh, with some outcomes. And combining the two, uh, there is a very uh, wonderful project uh, that we recently actually published a paper on in Nature Medicine. So the project is called Health Chain, where we, um, it's on triple negative breast cancer. And I mentioned previously that the issue with this disease, it's, um, it's uh, heterogeneity is poorly understood. And this is partially driven by the fact that in one single hospital, small data sets are available. So it's a rare disease, and that's why um, it's sometimes difficult to find data on the, multi on the large scale at one single hospital. So what we did is that we applied federated uh, learning in the multi-centric project. So we worked with multiple centers, uh, and we used our interpretable AI to link and predict uh, patient outcomes uh, in this project. And this is really a proof of concept study uh, in which federated learning is applied to real world, world data. And this paves the way for future biomarker discoveries. So, speaking of um, why, what are uh, the key success factors of OKIN, I would name three. So one of them, it's, uh, it's an AI center of excellence. We have uh, the world's best, very strong data science team. We have the best uh, um, doctors uh, that work with us. We have also medical expertise in-house uh, that are working on finding the right treatment for every patient. The second reason is that, um, so I've never seen from my personal experience a company that is actually more agile and mission driven. So everybody is really just focused on the mission of the company and um, yeah, and is, is working towards that. And the third thing is um, more from business perspective. So it's a business model adaptability. So Oaken started in 2016 uh, with five people and it was focusing back then more on the federated learning which, by the way, uh, we now made uh, open source um, since, I think, last year. Uh, but it then changed, listening to the market needs, uh, it changed to offering a more and more value-added services to our to pharma and biotechs, and it's moving more now towards becoming an AI biotech. So this business model adaptability and listening to the market, I would say it's another... Uh, key uh, strengths. So, all in all, um, just to summarize, um, traditional R&D has many challenges and there is a strong need for improvements, there is a strong need for innovation, and Okin is helping uh, change this and helping improve the, uh, the process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, she's here the entire evening, uh, so if you want to learn more about Oaken, please don't hesitate to reach out to her. Um, she's very happy to tell you all about it. But with that, I will relieve you from the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So, let me take you on a journey. And that journey started roughly four and a half years ago when someone had the idea Maybe we should start an innovation program and uh, do something in healthcare. Fast forward, we've conducted within that innovation program more than 100 pilots with 
multiple different uh, partners, but the most active being Roche. And that's all due to a very familiar face here on stage, so I'm very excited to welcome Jochen Hullebaus, the Head of Digital Innovation at Roche Diagnostics to the stage. Yeah, so hi everybody. Um, great that we have so many people back live here and uh, yeah, it's a familiar face, so I hope it's not uh, boring, like, oh no, again, like, you know, we have seen him so many times. So anyways, I try to make it still interesting. Um, you might also wonder why um, I will say it's actually the, the five-year anniversary already for us because actually we did have the, the batch zero, kind of where plug and play was already engaged, but it was not the official Creosphere we just announced in the plug and play partnership actually at the first Expo day of the Batch Zero, and we also announced uh, the brand Startup Creosphere. So we kind of have the pleasure of uh, celebrating twice the five year anniversary. One is now, and then the other one is in June. So why not f celebrating twice? That's already always good. So, yeah, we already heard, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, a, a team here that run a lot of pilots. So if you look just at the um, Roche pilots, it's uh, actually 76, but that includes the Silicon Valley and, and the Singapore programs. So uh, we had over the last five years uh, this number of pilots. Um, we are very proud to have 47% of follow-up collaborations with 28% or 25% uh, already actually in a commercial partnership and that sometimes we are like the customer of the startup which is actually the smaller amount. The others are like co-developments that we have been doing, uh, co-commercialization uh, projects with startups. So, we're really doing something and I hope out of these 47% there's still a few that also move into the commercial commercial phase in the next uh, or maybe throughout this year so um, this is what what, what we uh, do so we really want to make sure that uh, we actually work with the startups throughout the programs that something happens afterwards and yeah the team here is uh, just of course many many more people also in the background this is kind of the core team uh, you see that manages uh, together with plug and play uh, the three sites that we that we currently have and now on the next slide um, you see lots of pictures and it's probably after five years worthwhile to go a little bit through it I will not be able to to name actually on even only a fraction of the people that have contributed to the success of startup Creosphere but um, I think it's good to to reflect a little bit and indeed five years ago we said well you know what do we do uh, we, we believed we have to somehow work with the startups in digital because first of all, uh, Roche was not a digital company at that time. We did not have much internal uh, uh, knowledge about it. And secondly, in digital, you have so much innovation happening by startups because it's just the perfect uh, way for a startup, the perfect area to actually work because you don't need like big production facilities. You can actually just get started. And uh, so we said, well, that, that needs to happen. And we were very happy at that time to be in, on the left page here, you see picture of the Berg 1, which is here, uh, very close to here, an old industrial area where we just found also this perfect setup where there was a new CEO there who's like, oh yeah, health sounds kind of good. Maybe, you know, Florian, he's not, he couldn't make it here today, but uh, he's, uh, you know, he said, well, that, that, let's, let's try it out. So we just tried it out and then it developed in, in our first uh, successful batch. Uh, we had some really good startups. We had also the first internal uh, colleagues that were kind of exploring and they were all excited. They said, oh, this is actually great. You know, these startups <coughs> are actually fit to what we're looking for. And they actually already, some of them, you know, we had, I think, Fibrichek was in the first batch and, oh, they, they even have FDA approval with an app that really works. So at that time, this was just really surprising for people to say, oh, okay, this is actually interesting. And of course, all the learnings on, okay, but what does a startup not have, right? What do they have? But what do they need help from us as a big corporate? It developed over over the time, and then so you know we we kind of expanded. So the the, the next pictures are kind of the first um, plug and play activities here. There was not this space yet, so we were at another event space here around the corner. Then you see on the on the top right side, at least the Roche people will know him. That's our chairman until yesterday. Now Severin is the chairman, but this was is Christoph Franz who was the chairman. Um, here on the lower left side, some people might also know. That guy, that's Thomas Schinecker, our new CEO um, of the Roche Group, actually. So he, uh, since yesterday, so he was here the very first time. The, the Batch Zero, he was at the Expo Day, he was super excited, and you know, without him, 
probably also we wouldn't be here today to be very, very clear, right? So this combination of, yeah, we just do something, we get the great startups, we, we work with them, we, we do concrete projects, all the pilot project owners, of course, is essential, but I think it was equally essential to have people like Thomas, like, like Christoph Franz, uh, also coming to our uh, expo days or startup days, presenting, giving their view that, hey, uh, I think that was actually Severin, or our CEO until yesterday, now the new chairman, who said, uh, who always said, hey, you know, 99% of the innovation happens outside of Roche. Or actually, he said 99.9% .9 of the innovation happens outside Roche. So, we do great innovation, but let's be clear, there is much, much more outside, and if we don't tap into that, we will just not, not be successful in the long run. So, yeah, we had this top management uh, support. Then we had also COVID, like everybody else uh, in this world, unfortunately. We had to move to fully virtual, um, which worked well. We still had quite some uh, good pilots, and we had a high uh, rate of continuation after the, after the CreaSphere program. Um, but it was not exactly the same, right? And we hear that now also when people come back here to these uh, events, they like, wow, this is just so much different because, uh, yeah, you can work with a team, a small team on, on your project, but if you can hear network, you, you get a lot new contacts, you get new ideas. So this creative space here, we are really happy to, to have it back. So we came back um, um, stronger. I think we ca came also back um, as Roche. We had a, a big transformation through, through COVID at the same time. So we have a new unit called Roche Information Solution. All digital activities in diagnostics have been put into that new unit, which is about a thousand employees. So it's, uh, it's a big startup um, uh, with lots of activities in digital and lots of exploration. So uh, you see some of the new leaders here. You see um, Moritz in the middle of the hat and then Oka and my line manager here with the blue shirt. So they are also active. They like this program, they, they come. And actually, the, also on the very right side, you see Matthias uh, here, the, broker, the global program uh, uh, lead for Creosphere, um, at the Bits and Bratzels conference, which is then uh, another addition we made last year the first time. will be also this year again in, in June here in Munich, uh, which is, uh, we, we believe, still the, the biggest entrepreneurial uh, festival in, in Europe for digital health. Um, so we are looking forward into that and uh, beyond this expansion of into the ecosystem, into bringing more and more uh, people and entrepreneurs uh, in working with us. Uh, we are also now working on expanding our program even more into also enabling more local innovation, local activities, because that's the other thing about digital. Digital is actually very local, right? So yes, you have some global players, of course, but at the same time, everybody wants his own little app. Every patient in every country is a bit different. There's different cultures, there's different systems. So we need to also be able to actually support the local innovation. And it only works with partnerships because we cannot uh, build thousands of different systems as a big company. So the ecosystem approach is the one we believe in. Uh, that's the one we believe in innovation ecosystems, but also in digital ecosystems. And I think with that, I will just move on um, a little bit into the topics, which are still the same, right? Uh, we're tapping into new businesses. Um, that's that's uh, one of our uh, key activities. We are augmenting our core diagnostic diagnostics business with diagnostic tools that we that we might help uh, interpreting data, um, or also helping biomarker, uh, bringing biomarkers or, or point of care solutions to patients. Uh, but then we are also working on the internal value chain, which. Uh, we have seen some topics today also from Biotronic, where you work on implementing um, or improving your efficiency in, internally and, and things like that. So I'm not going into the companies. Well, on the right side, actually, I, I will you know, not mention them. These are all, I think, all of them past uh, program uh, participants, not from, from this year, but you can see that we have quite a few. And since I'm out of time, I'm sorry, I will not go into the details, but it's a broad number of things in each of these categories. We had lots of success and, and we have products on the market together with the startups. I'm very happy about that. But now, as always, let's try to give most of the time to the startups. Thank you so much, Jochen, and really looking forward to the five year anniversary that we have in summer, the second one for you. Um, so last year and beginning this year as well, uh, probably 
same for me as for most of you. I've been on a gazillion different conferences and there was one comment that stuck by me and that was the attention span of every individual is seven minutes. And why am I telling you that? Yeah, you guessed it. I'm going to be the annoying moderator that makes you stand up all to quickly uh, move a little bit and then we can have, and then we can jump into the startups. <laughs> all right. So I think we can sit down now and really shine the limelight on the startups and the collaborations that have happened over the last 12 weeks. <laughs> Fabulous. So the first... <laughs> So we're now jumping into a clinical setting and then also into the setting of ventilation. And during ventilation, there's a lot of obviously mechanical procedures that are happening, but also a lot of data exchange um, and data points collected. What you can do with those data points, I would like to welcome Jakubas and Martin to the stage to tell you about their collaboration. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'm Martin. I'm from the Roche startup. So we worked together with Acrox. And um, yeah, Jokobas will take you onto a journey. He will tell you a story. Yeah. And the story will take you to the ICU, the intensive care unit of a hospital. And of course, nobody wants to be there because people in the intensive care unit are seriously ill. But if you happen to be there, you better watch out that the Acros Roche solution is in place in that ICU. And with that, I hand over to Jokubas and take us to the story. Thanks a lot. Before starting, I would like kindly ask you a favor just to turn your imagination. Let's imagine that you are a physician at the intensive care unit, at the hospital, and you are the head of that intensive unit. There are 40 beds, almost all of them they are occupied by the patients. And it's New Year's Eve. But you are not with your friends or family at home, you are at work, 24 hours long shift because of lack of medical workers in your hospital. You are tired. You are in a bad mood. And you have critical patient. Female patient, 44 years old, 58 kilograms weight, with brain injury. And you have a lot of data to do a prompt and accurate decision on that data. But you cannot be focused because you are tired, because you are in bad mood, and because you, you hear that continuous alarms and beepings in the world. But your main task is to save her life. According to scientists, 52% of all deaths in the intensive care unit can be prevented. It, did, it just needed to ensure that 24 hours will be continuously monitored patients. But it's impossible to do it in classical ways because we have big shortage of medical workers at the world. Another research shows that Real-time analytical tools on patients, which is connected to mechanical ventilators, can save up to 1,100 euro per patient. So, if we will take in mind that there are 
100,000 beds in the intensive care units in Europe. That means that we can save up to 4.8 billion euros annually. That's why our team developed artificial intelligence software for remote monitoring and decision support, which assists for clinicians and nurses in the intensive care unit. But this was just a starting point. After we started collaborating with Roche on a joint pilot project, we realized that combining two devices, two main key devices at the intensive care unit can change this to the next level. Because these devices provides a lot of key parameters based on which physicians and nurses do decisions saving life for the patients. How everything started? Three months ago, we had great kickoff meeting in Vilnius, in Lithuania. We were in the hospital, in the intensive care unit, and output of this meeting was five hypotheses. After that, we validated those hypotheses by doing overview of scientific papers, also interviews and questionnaire with uh, physicians and nurses from different countries. And we prepared the concept of our joint solution. I am glad that in these three months, we did quite a good job because we already started collecting the data in the hospital. And also, we prepared first version of the main feature, which will enrich data from mechanical lung ventilation devices, that blood gas analyzer feature. Here you can see the concept of our joint solution. The solution is cloud-based. That means that all the data from two key devices is transferred to the cloud where machine learning algorithms process and analyze the data and provides valuable information for the physicians and nurses. Main features, remote monitoring. That means that it's enough to have mobile phone or laptop with internet access and you can monitor your patients from Munich. For example, your hospital is in Berlin, so you can monitor your patients from here. Also, another important feature is notifications, timely notifications. That means that you don't need to monitor patients uh, to monitor patients 24 hours. You just need to have your mobile device next to you and you will get notification on concrete patient. Secondly, it's important that this tool provides an analytical feature and you can analyze the historical data of patients for different purposes. But last and not least is recommendations based on artificial intelligence. And this feature allows for physicians and nurses to get prompt information what to do with the concrete patient on different situations. And this solution will contribute a lot for solving main problems as shortage of medical workers, also reducing the workload of the physicians and nurses in the ICU, and what is very important, the cost of ICU. We also prepare the future plan in general. We will continue collecting the data. Also, we are working on our technical part, optimizing data collection from a blood gas analyzer, Later, we are planning to start clinical validation, certification procedures also going to market, and last thing, also 
if it will be possibility to add more sources of data. To achieve good results, we can do with the, only with a good uh, team. So we are a very diverse team with different knowledge, different skills, but very united and with common vision and common goals and same values. So I'm very happy that we can work with such good team. And let's imagine once again that we are those patients in the intensive care unit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, you two. Really exciting to see that project and can't wait to see where it's heading to. So now we're taking our focus a little bit towards a different direction. And I think most of every one of you probably have heard about digital biomarkers and potentially in a, let's say, a more wellness way, some of you might be wearing a wearable, a smartwatch, collecting data and evaluating them, more or less regular. But it's kind of a tedious process from time to time to charge the watch, to think about uh, every kind of uh, aspect that's associated to it. So it's not as useful potentially in a clinical setting. So wouldn't it be nice to have that in a garment, in a fabric that you anyways wear, and that way you can quite smoothly track data through that. That's something that Sensoria is doing, and I would like to well, welcome Davide and Mathieu to the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, first of all, thank you to the organizing team, uh, Plague and Play, the corporate partners, and everyone involved in making that event happen. And we are super proud to be here. Um, you will, so we had the chance over the past months to work very closely with Sensoria, and we have the chance to have um, Davide with us on site. He's coming all over from Seattle, so we're very happy to have you on site. Um, he'll take you through the pilot in a few in a few seconds. So you'll see that it's about a new type of wearable that's supposed to be used for uh, the treatment of heart failure and the monitoring of heart failure. So it's a disease that's affecting 64 million people worldwide and with dramatically poor prognosis as soon as it's detected. So I'll just add that it's, um, we've been quite impressed with the capabilities that they've showed up, the quality and the speed of execution and we are really welcome the opportunity to share the outcome of their work today with you. It's the video. Thank you, Mattia. It was fun working with you. Uh, we actually worked across the ocean, literally. We were on the Pacific coast, 15 hours of flights to get here, but <laughs> in spite of the a little a jet lag, uh, I'm super excited to be here. So in spite of the jet lag, this morning we probably did the same thing. We all woke up, we took a shower, and we put our clothes on, right? garments, footwear, wouldn't it be nice to inject medical device technology into whatever a patient does every day, every morning? That would reduce the compliance challenge that the medical device industry has been plagued with for the past 25, 30 years, right? Because we have to convince the patient to actually use the medical device to remember. And behavioral change is always a really, really, really challenging issue, as we all know. So at Sensoria, we're former Microsoft. My partner in crime, my CTO, is an Xbox Live program manager. And uh, we worked on healthcare at Microsoft for many, many years. Uh, the people that actually uh, have uh, a lot of healthcare experience, you probably remember we built before Azure and AWS. We actually built Health Vault, which, which was a PHR system. We interfaced with 425 medical devices only to see that there was no data coming through. A halter device is used once a year. So really, that was the challenge. We're from Italy originally, and we thought, why don't we create a transparent computing experience and build the sensors into whatever people, people wear? And that's what Sensoria uh, came about for, right? So we have a multidisciplinary team, as you can see. So we have a passion for healthcare, of course, but we have primarily all the engineering resources that you can imagine. There are material engineering, electronic engineering, mechanical engineering, signal processing engineering, and once, once you actually have all these resources working together, you can actually see an, a, a signal processing engineering person solving a software engineering challenge and so forth. But the most important thing is, uh, in the past four years, we've been able to actually deliver 
what we think is the first uh, modular architecture and platform for actually delivering what we just discussed. So we deliver textile sensors, we deliver the piece of electronics that actually connects to those sensors, and a cloud infrastructure for remote patient monitoring as well. So the goal, as uh, Mathieu said, was to actually uh, focus on a challenge which is heart failure. Heart failure is a challenge of epidemic proportions with 64 million people in 2022 suffering from heart failure. The cost is over $108 billion worldwide. Um, and th the challenge that we actually faced was, how do we actually collect data sets that could help a clinician reduce the risk of rehospitalization? So this is a secondary prevention challenge. And the project was, can Sensoria in eight weeks build an actual hardware device that can collect meaningful data that could potentially prevent the risk of re recurrence, right? So, which is very common. 50% uh, of these patients actually have recurrence issue, unfortunately, and mortality when it comes to congestive heart failure is one out of two patients, right? So, unfortunately, mortality is 50%. So, we talked to cardiologists, we interviewed them, and they all told us the same thing. We want to know two things. Since there is fluids that are actually generated by this condition, we would like to know either weight, changes in weight, or the position and the delta change in the circumference of the ankle of the patient. Why? Because of course the fluids, due to gravity, tend to go to the bottom of our body, which is our feet and our ankles. So if we can see that there is actually a swelling, edema, in, at the ankle level, there is potentially a risk of recurrence. Number two, we want to know if the patient goes to the bathroom at night. Why? Because, of course, if there are fluids in the body, that person will have more often urination challenges, right? They will wake up at night and go to the bathroom. So what we built was a remote patient monitoring system to actually detect those two biomarkers, if you will, right? So these two data sets could create novel biomarkers as well. This is actually an example of uh, the devices that Sensoria has been able to uh, build in the past. Uh, what you see here, and I'll show it to you, is uh, a sock with uh, textile pressure sensors embedded at the plantar area of the foot. We're using it for Parkinson's as an example. This actually has been proven to be as uh, reliable as a gait assessment tool like uh, OptiTrack or Mobility Lab to monitor activity of, uh, of patients. Uh, we have built uh, a boot for diabetic foot ulcerations. And for each one of those solutions that you see on the left side of this slide, we built algorithms, synthetic algorithms, that actually collect data from the patient, a mobile application to interface with the patient to, po to provide positive reinforcement, and of course, a clinician dashboard where the patient population gets color-coded, so each cohort gets populated red, yellow, or green, depending on whether they are within the range of normality for those cohorts that the researchers have identified. So let me show you how the, the system actually works. This is actually the solution that we built. Uh, there's supposed to be a video starting here, so hopefully someone can actually get started the video here. Um, it's not there. Okay, so you'll be able to actually see the video at this link that we have here. So we have built a textile anklet that actually can see not only the activity of the patient, but as soon as the ankle actually increases in volume, you will see the, 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 the volume of the, of, the, of the ankle changing in raw data. And the raw data, the raw data is actually shown, uh, shown right there. Um, how do we do this? Uh, the electronics is actually built, uh, as you can see here, with the Sensoria Core device. The Sensoria Core device has seven open channels. So we have textile sensors, again, underlining textile sensors. But also, the Sensoria Core device comes with uh, a nine-axis IMU that is built into the device itself. Uh, you can see the anklet right here. The anklet is 100% textile. And we built a mobile application, which we'll show, I will show you in a second uh, here. We built a full user experience in six weeks. 
and the, the cloud infrastructure as, as well. So when the patient actually scans the QR code, it gets actually connected to the anklet. Once the anklet is connected, there is a quick uh, video that shows the patient how to use the anklet. And then as you can see here, we have a daily and night report for each one, each one of the nights that the patient is actually wearing this device. And you can see in this case, the extension of the anklet was above 50%. So when the patient went to sleep, his ankle size was 50% smaller than when, we, when he woke up. So that's clearly a, a, an indicator of a potential challenge right there. Uh, immediately, we propose an offer to call, in that case, a doctor. This could be an emergency type of situation. But in, the, in general, you can actually see that we have been able to not only create the hardware, but also build the, the software infrastructure. And uh, we're actually including the feedback that we're providing to clinicians. There are potentially other biomarkers as well that we can, uh, that we can leverage. The next step will be to define, define the ranges of normality. So is 30% ankle swelling okay? Is 50% ankle swelling not okay? So we need guidance on creating those type of threshold, what we call threshold of normality. Um, and once we have that, hopefully we can actually move into a clinical trial type of scenario where we collect a lot of data and, uh, and uh, evaluate that data as well. This is just the beginning. If you're interested in some of the other uh, resources and devices that we already have available, you can go to sensoria.io and the full SDK is available there. So we provide researchers with the raw data. So we have actually a tool that actually collects the data from each one of the sensors. So you can build your own algorithms as, uh, as well. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you, Lawrence and Mike. Truly, really, truly impressive um, what you've accomplished and what you've developed here. Please, as a quick reminder, we will have the Best Pilot Pitch Award later onwards, so keep that always in mind when you see the startups which you like best. We're now diving into more the point of care side of things and especially a physician's office. Um, there is a lot of information and every patient is different. Wouldn't it be nice that a doctor has a tool that helps him or her to evaluate the patient in front of them, but in a very modular way, so that they can actually influence how they are supported? That's something that AvoMD has developed. They call it a universal layer of modular decision support. How they work on that with Roche together, uh, the stage here is up to uh, Lawrence and Mike. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Mike Coyle. I'm a product manager in Roche Information Solutions working on the Navify algorithm suite. Um, this is Lawrence Coleman and he is representing AvoMD and we're gonna walk you through um, a collaboration that actually started at HIMSS uh, last year and now has kind of carried us forward. So we're pretty excited to show you what we're doing. Uh, so our goal is to have happy doctors. So this is a doctor on the beach drinking a pina colada. So <laughs> thank God for technology. <laughs> So within the Navify algorithm suite, we are building a new product. It's a cloud-based solution to bring clinical algorithms together to go right into the clinical practice. And there are four important things that we can do uh, from a Roche standpoint to bring something new and novel to the doctors. So it's important to leverage our core business and making it relevant for the patients. We want to make sure that we follow certified approvals, regulated processes, and then also having evidence to support these algorithms. Now the last piece is really important, and so this is where AvoMD can help. The solution has to fit for the doctors. It could be the next greatest thing, and if it doesn't fit in their workflow, they won't use it. And so being able to bring something to bear right for them um, is, is what will really make this work. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Lawrence. He's gonna walk you through what we've done and also give you an overview of AvoMD and the solution. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so I'm one of three co-founders of AvoMD. 
my two co-founders are physicians and informaticians and coders, and they actually built AvoMD initially as a solution to solve their own problem at the point of care, which is it's very difficult to access the evidence in the workflow. So that's exactly what we do. We're oper operationalizing clinical and medical knowledge into the workflow. And we're fortunate enough to have started partnering with some of the leading providers, medical societies, and life sciences companies in the US and globally in order to achieve this aim. So how do we achieve this aim? Well, our platform takes clinical knowledge and that could incorporate or include clinical guidelines, uh, hospital-based pathways, and a lot more types of things. And that knowledge is translated into point-of-care workflows seamlessly using a no-code builder. Um, and that decision support is made available on our point-of-care application, which integrates into the EHR. We're already live and available on Epic's app market. It doesn't have to integrate. We're web and mobile friendly. And let me show you what it looks like. Let's say a patient comes in, they're seeking treatment for blood pressure, high blood pressure, and they have chronic kidney disease. So uh, the relevant workflow would pop up. Let's say that patient's over 18 and has all these various clinical criteria of CKD. And then in seconds, our software recommends a uh, certain blood pressure goal, other interventions from, directly from the guidelines, uh, relevant and specific to that patient, patient educational materials, the clinician can access the underlying references, and more. And all this is extremely customizable, can be built for any decision. When it integrates into the EHR, we can help the clinician build their own note, as well as actually generate orders and tests based on the recommendation. We've run randomized controlled trials, and in customer implementations, we've been able to demonstrate our software saves clinicians over 50% of their time at the point of care, while improving diagnostic accuracy by 20% and enhancing patient outcomes. That workflow and all the workflows are built or created on our builder, which is no code, meaning uh, clinicians can create this themselves and they don't need IT or coding knowledge to do so. Um, everything can be built uh, for really for any clinical decision, for any workflow um, across specialties and disease states. Um, and because we've removed the typical barriers uh, uh, with our technology that usually get in the way of deploying workflows like needing hospital IT to get involved, needing informatics experts to get involved. We've automated all that into this tool, so that allows us to help hospitals create their workflows very quickly. One of our customers in Minnesota, their implementation cycles went down from six to eight months to the matter of hours and, and days. Finally, this is the tool that uh, we are integrating with the Roche algorithm suite. So we're able to incorporate the uh, Roche set of clinical algorithms, such as the chest pain triage algorithm, which is where we're starting with, embed that into our workflow builder. And then what the clinician sees is, uh, based on certain patient criteria, the intelligence will be run through the Roche system and then essentially help the clinician uh, through the relevant workflows based on that data and that output. So over the last few months, Mike and I and our teams have been working pretty closely to understand whether or not a, you know, we should explore a pilot and how, um, how successful it could be. And so we did that along uh, three main dimensions. First was the technical feasibility. Um, you know, could our products integrate and would it be tough? And our product and engineering teams came together and um, very quickly uh, we were able to assess that uh, the integration would be really not a problem. Um, on the commercial side of things, we centered on AvoMD um, actually leading go to market. Um, we're already selling our standalone solution in the market now. Uh, we're in Epic's app market. Uh, we're, we're quick, and so we thought this would be the fastest way for us to generate revenue um, together. Uh, and then revenue would be shared um, with you know, RevShare Economics. Finally, we've identified um, a large US academic medical center uh, that's already raised their hand um, and expressed interest in our combined offering. Uh, Mike has had and his team have had multiple conversations with these clinical leaders and we're actually going to be jointly pitching them in a couple weeks. So with that said, I'll pass the mic back to Mike for Thanks. some closing thoughts. So accelerating innovation um, to the clinical practice is what we're trying to do. And with this joint solution, we can really see where there's benefits on both sides. Uh, for AvoMD and for Roche, and also for clinicians and patients. So for Roche, 
we get access to a solution that's already being proven in, 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 uh, in clinical practice today. And we get access to their real hands-on and tactical approach of working with customers to drive these changes. I mean, every hospital is kind of a snowflake, so being able to manage this um, with a software solution is, is really great. For AVOMD, um, of course, we have our medical algorithms. So these are software medical devices with CE marks, FDA approval, that they can now incorporate into their offering for their customers. <clears throat> and then finally, Roche obviously has a, a large uh, customer base. So now um, a, a group based in the US now has access to a global range of customers that we can start to explore um, cardiology and other use cases. And so when we assess the, the whole package of the solution here, accelerating to market, um, improving the, the workflow for the, for the providers, and also the quality of care for the patients, this is really a win-win-win-win solution. And so we still have our doctor who's happy drinking her pina colada, and then it also produced a patient jumping for joy. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for, for, uh, for, for watching, and we look forward to speaking with you uh, at the event later tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lawrence and Mike. Um, truly amazing how quickly you integrated that and uh, really excited to see when you roll out. Um, next up, I don't know, I've, I've seen a couple of days ago in a LinkedIn post a photo of someone laying on the, uh, on the floor and like two rows of paper next to him, stating that's the average documentation that you need to fill out to be admitted to a hospital in the UK. Like, that's crazy. If you think about it, that's close to a little bit less than four meters of paper. So obviously, there's a tremendous amount of automation that could happen there and also a lot of back work, uh, back end work that needs to be done. Our next company and our next pilot that has happened is with a company called Automation Hero. They developed a platform which is super pow powerful to, well, interact and process any type of document way quicker than the typical what you would do, uh, what you would do every day, but also process it in, in a way that you can actually deduct knowledge out of it and connotate it in an intelligent way. With that, Automation Hero, one note, uh, that's one of the American startups, so we have them virtually join, but we have one of the representatives here on the ground. Conrad, maybe if you can quickly, here, there he is. So if you're interested, uh, chat with him later, but the stage now is yours, and, uh, Andreas and Brandy. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Brandi Morrison, a corporate account director covering some of our largest health systems here in the US for our sales organization. I have been working with my pilot co-owner, Kevin Day, a finance and operations enablement lead, as well as our third team member, Hannah Edwards, who is the chief of staff for contracts, pricing and operations. And we are all here today because tracking and reporting customer contract compliance has become a really big challenge. Um, as our business grows and our customers become larger and more complex, so does our contracting. Today, the process of monitoring, measuring, and reporting compliance for our thousands of contracts is a very manual and time-consuming process. And because of this challenge, we had many areas of our business, you know, sales, finance, contracts, and pricing, just to name a few, recognize the, the huge need to develop an automated solution to help both our teams and our customers manage this really important task. By automating compliance, not only would we save a great deal of valuable time, but it allows us to empower our teams and our customers to analyze and address compliance in a more proactive instead of reactive manner. And not only that, and, and certainly last but not least, it really allows Roche to better ensure that we are capturing the revenue that our customers have committed. 
So when you have a challenge of this magnitude that you need to solve, you know, what do you need? Well, you need a hero. And in this case, automation hero. So let me introduce you to our fantastic pilot partner, Automation Hero. Andreas. Thank you for the nice introduction, Brandy. So yeah, hi there. Uh, my name is Andreas. I'm a lead sales engineer and I am an automation hero. Um, as you can see uh, here, I am an automation hero helping Roche to connect the data dots. Um, you might wonder what it means to be an automation hero. In the very specific case of Roche, it means we're integrating and connecting siloed data. The data the hero is connecting is sales records, contracts, and reseller information. The data is disparate and disconnected due to oftentimes simple errors like typos, different spellings of company names, addresses, etc. By fuzzy matching these disconnected data sets, we establish a single source of truth that feeds a compliance dashboard to support Roche in evaluating resellers' contractual commitments, provide automated warnings in case of contract violations, drive preactive sales engagement, and through that, drive the company's revenue. All of this will ultimately turn Roche into their own heroes, not wearing capes, not wielding superpowers, but drastically removing the effort needed to stay on top of sales and contract commitments to automation heroes. How do we do or how do we connect these data dots? Um, we connect those using our AI native cloud platform. Our platform delivers a two to three times more accurate automation rate than other vendors out there. We help automate previously impossible use cases, extract new insights, typically locked up in documents or data. Uh, with a broad set of ready to use AI models, we natively handle any type of data or document structured or unstructured, handwritten or typed in dozens of languages, all on top of a powerful and flexible execution platform. A complete solution that includes, on the one hand, scalable, and on the other hand, reliable document processing and automation. API integrations with hundreds of data sources, in your very specific case here, it's a Snowflake data source mostly, um, powerful post-processing for data cleansing, context matching, fuzzy matching, and data enrichment. And of course, everything with enterprise-grade security that ensures uh, secure data processing. All of this is done through one integrated agile no-code platform that provides a fast time to value without having to rely on large IT teams that allows anyone to respond to continuously evolving future needs and become their own automation hero. Um, that was it from my side. Make sure to meet my colleague Conrad. I'm sorry I couldn't be in Munich today, um, but yeah, um, ask him for more. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, you two. Great to have you two with us virtually. Jumping now into the next data problem, we're on trajectory to generate exponential amounts of data. Uh, it's just accelerating everybody. Just thinking about uh, all the data that is uh, aggregated just when you drive a car or when you use your phone or when you use variables. All of that um, gives us a massive amount of data, but mostly or often that data points are unstructured. Unstructured data points do not really help us to develop something with that. So that is equally true for every aspect of life as it is in a clinical setting. And therefore, we need a solution that actually structures the unstructured data. And with that, I'd like to welcome the company Malax Tech and Xiang Yang and Stephanie to the stage. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Kaufmann, and I lead a team of data scientists within data and analytics for Roche Information Solutions. And I would like to introduce you to the pilot that we did with Melax Tech in the past three months that was all about, um, as the introduction already said, getting structured data out of unstructured patient reports. 
Now, in an ideal world, we would not even have to deal with that problem. In an ideal world, hospitals and physicians would already capture the data of any patient in a neat and structured format. But unfortunately, reality is not there quite yet. Um, some hospitals already capture data in a quite structured format, um, but they also might include some free text uh, fields for the physicians to fill in additional notes. Other hospitals um, rely still very much on um, reports that are written up by physicians um, that ca capture most of the information of the patient and that are then um, uploaded in a PDF format to the system. And if you go to a general practitioner in Germany, you might even sometimes see them putting pen to paper, um, but hopefully this will soon be a thing of the past. Now, in these um, reports, uh, a lot of information of the patient is hidden, and this is information um, that we desperately need for upstream processing, information like um, a tumor type, a tumor dimension as well, um, biomarkers that have been measured and the exact measurements. And we need this information to recommend the right treatments, recommend further testing, but also just to give the physician a good overview of all of the information that the, is already available on the patient. So to do um, that and extract this information automatically to avoid what we have shown here, which is a physician struggling with data input, um, we are looking to a solution that is called um, natural language processing. And we did the pilot with Melax Tech in the last three months to look into their capabilities to automatically extract this data. Now handing over to Xiaoyan to tell you more about that. Thank you, Steffi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Xiaoyan Wang, uh, CISO of Mlex Tech. In the next few minutes, I will introduce you who we are as Mlex Tech and what I have been doing with Steffi's team and what we can build together in the future. Um, Mlex Tech is a company uh, we are a technology company specialized in biomedical natural language processing, briefer as NLP, as Steffi just mentioned. So there are two types of data in this world. One is structured data, uh, such as you know, a medication table prescribed by a physician, or all the diagnosis codes from a hospital. There was another kind which is unstructured, examples like clinical notes written by a doctor or health news from a government, literature, research papers published from a university. Those are natural text. So in clinical world, 80% of in clinical information existed only in notes. That's exactly the area we targeting to solve. We are a company spin off from academic medical centers. In the past decades, we've been published 300 papers in NLP innovation. And um, though all those NLP challenge tests will be ranking top one or two, spin over all kinds of biomedical textual data, such as literature, social media, clinical notes. And this is only a partial list of the world we have been winning. And remember, our competitors are those big tech companies such as Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. In the last five years, um, we actually kept average 40% increase for our annual revenue. And the team has been doubled in the past year. Um, the 80% of our scientists our PhD is trained in medical informatics, and the four of us are actually professors from academic medical schools. So we keep our team small but smart. So our technology has been used and trusted by many of our customers. They spin over in different sections of healthcare, hospitals, technologies, and biopharma industries as well. So for this pilot project, uh, Steffi illustrated nicely on the challenges they've been facing. As you can see on the left side, 
So those are the typical pathological nodes containing very rich pathological information, which can be used to guide decision-making at the bedside and also the knowledge discovering at the bench site. Ideally, you would like to see all those informations extracted meaningfully and normalized, encoded in standard terminologies. The challenge is, can you retrieve those information with accuracy and at scale? So the simple answer is yes, we can. So briefly, the first st step we've been doing is annotation. So there is a very simple way to understand what we've been doing in NLP. Think about, you know, as a human being, we understand this word as what are they and how they related. That's exactly the way we teach our machines to learn. Okay, this is how a pathologist really think and document, and we translate that understanding into annotation is our tool showing here, and with our tools, and this is the final annotation, document a physician's understanding about what are they, how they related. Next step is modeling. So machines or NLP technologies has been advanced quickly in the last decades, and we've been using cutting edge technologies such as deep learning and transformer technologies in this project. And this is the tool we build all those things together customized for this project. And this is one of the architecture for deep learning technologies in the pipeline development. So after we taught the machine to learn a pathologist understanding our nodes, we got all those results from NLP. We want to realize and check uh, so end users can easily check, okay, this is the results of the outputs. Can they use that to build the cohort for insight generation? So we, provide, we actually provide the platforms doing both as you can see, insight generated automatically. This is the performance we've achieved for this project. As you can see, if the information is documented in the notes, we have been able to, using our technologies, to read it with accuracy on um, millions of notes, if you have those. Besides English, we also work on different languages, such as Chinese, Korean, Spanish. Stavis team is now exploring a project of multilingual NLP. So we work together uh, on how we move that forward with our solutions. So there are, beyond this pilot project, there are many directions that we could head together in the future. Uh, again, we are the technology companies connecting all the biomedical textual data, knowledge, and insight together. Pathology oncology is not the only type of nodes we've been working on. We actually work on different type of um, nodes for different type of diseases in immunology, neuroscience, um, or all kind of real diseases, et cetera. With our technology, we're able to outline the patient journey from the time he or she was born and track all the symptoms, signs, procedures, diagnosis along the trajectory. So that is the depth we can go for particular patients. Besides that, we have another dimension because we have access to more than 10 medical centers so we can actually see the patient in a both steps, and also we see more patients, millions of patients at one time. Clinical notes is not only text we've been working on. Clinical trial design, which is including exploring criteria for drug discovery, we processed thousands of clinical trials and tabulate them into knowledge base. Right now, we're working with a global farmer to optimize their clinical design with our technology and doing simulations from real-world data. People express their opinions in social media with text. 
For example, they write something about their personal experience and um, they believe in vaccine, yes, no. So thinking about remaining millions of those posts, we able to understand how a particular person really, his decision or his belief on vaccine was affected by government policies, health news, his friend circles. So right now we're also working with one of our customers building up those patient reported outcomes to understand, you know, particular disease for specific communities such as LGBT communities or different age group communities. Literature is another rich source for knowledge discovery. Traditionally, systematic literature review is done manually. We automated that process and be able to realize all those data elements from literature real time. Build upon the knowledge, um, build upon all those uh, knowledge from literature using NLP, we also imported transformers and scoring systems and generate new knowledge using knowledge graph. Think about if you design a compound treating a particular disease, you're probably wondering, okay, can I really repurposing this compound for different indications? What do you do with it? So you basically mining through all the existing knowledge, find all the interconnected concept, and then find the new one. That is also another drug repurposing project we've been working with one of the big pharma. By far, I will share to you all those LP Plus of platforms we built for clinical documents, social media, literature, et cetera. Think about the power of integrating all those data and the knowledge together. You would have the full landscape of a disease or any of the area of interest in healthcare. I could go on and on about what we can do, but we got to stop here. Before I finish here, I'd like to thank so many of you, um, you know, Rosh's team, Christine, Steffi's team, and also the Chris Fear for this opportunity. We thank every one of you, you know, Steffi, Lucia, Neil, and all of you for the great work together. And I'll remember all those morning meetings with all of you, and which kicks off my good days in the past three months. Thank you, everyone. Um, um, if you have any questions, come to find me after this. So we're now jumping a little bit into a different area of uh, medicine and uh, more on the area of monitoring, screening, and obviously everybody of us should do that or should do that at a certain age um, for, for some diseases, but it's typically associated with the step that you go to the doctor, get the test, go to the doctor again, get the results. There's a company um, based out of the States, which is called I'm Aware, um, that has found a different path to follow up on that. Um, Given that they are part of our American batch, uh, we will have them virtually on stage to talk about their pilot. So, Yanni, Michael, the stage is yours. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so, my name is Michael Bennett. I work here as a product manager in the US, um, and I'm just gonna briefly introduce um, our startup crease for a project with Yanni and Amur. So, um, this is our tagline right here, know before you go. So as you can see, we're looking at the different, di di different diagnostic solutions. I won't dive too much into it. I'll let Yanni dive into it, but this is a very exciting project. There's a lot of energy behind this. Um, and so this is a little bit about the Roche working team. So we had Allie Hellman and Jeffrey Turns, who were also very involved with this project. And we're just really looking to see if how can we address certain issues in healthcare and how can we work alongside a startup to explore these options and opportunities. And one thing that definitely came up when we're thinking about this is how we're going to Software for innovation. And if you're actually thinking and looking at I'm Aware, they definitely uh, put that best foot forward. All it does, you take one look at their profile on their website, definitely see they're an innovation first company, digital tech forward, and actually looking to build um, the future of healthcare. 
So I really hope you enjoy our presentation. It was a lot of uh, great time in working with uh, Yanni in the I'm Aware team. But now I will go ahead and I'll pass it off to Yanni for his part of the presentation. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. So my name is Yanni Tuami. I'm the founder of I'm Aware. We are focused on at home and return to lab types of testings here in the United States. And I'm coming to you live from freezing Austin, Texas, where it has gotten below zero degrees. Um, so with that said, today's focus will be talking about our STI and STD platform. For those of you who don't know what I'm Aware is about, um, we'll introduce that real quickly. We'll focus in on our STI capabilities and then share a little more about what we've been up to at Roche. So talking about I'm Aware real brief, uh, for about the last five years, we've really focused on being the scientific leader in the home testing space. There are many out there who do offer testing from different modalities, including you know looking at a strand of hair to tell you what kind of food you should eat. Some of these aren't really backed in science, but myself along with two other PhD co-founders, one of whom had helped debunk Theranos, we really wanted to build a science first at home testing platform. So in 2018, when we launched our first test, we also published that in CCLM, which is a leading clinical chemistry magazine. So we've been always focused on generating data, venous to cap studies, stability data, transport data, to make sure that tests that we offer at home are equivalent to gold standard phlebotomy or in-lab tests. But we wrap that around a patient experience that we believe is second to none. And so some examples of our work throughout life here so far has been supporting companies, whether it's in routine testing, in engaging in micronutrients and improvements in food, food as medicine, or looking at fertility tests to keep, you know, those types of people who are thinking about starting a family focused on that and not worried about their biomarker health. So when it comes to looking at our STI opportunity here, most people don't realize it, but outside of COVID, the STI pandemic, which really hasn't been labeled as such, has been staggering. There's significant numbers of growing uh, concern around how big this really is. And in fact, it's growing very rapidly. There were significant numbers in the tens of millions of people who had new STIs. And the percentage of Americans, for example, is staggering in terms of the total number who've been infected. And the cost to economy and to life and, and to insurance is also quite significant. So despite efforts around education, there still is a lot that is even going undocumented, untested. And preliminary CDC data suggests that this has continued to increase well through 21 and 22. And so what we've noticed out of all of this is that testing is lagging. The opportunity for easy to use private types of tests where individuals can do this in their own home setting or more comfortable settings continues to lag behind the growth in, in the actual new infections. So as we dug deeper into the uh, market research on this, we wanted to look at two different ways. So a lot of our competitors out in space really focus on DTC and, and they make very expensive tests, $180 tests, which you know is, is not always achievable for everybody to afford. And where we wanted to go was to work alongside healthcare professionals and public health and taking some of our COVID experiences where we worked with uh, CDC and, and many in the state of Texas to bring really valid testing protocols, we wanted to open up a more B2B approach for STI testing. So in essence, offering up our digital capabilities, lab testing capabilities through to these other entities. And one thing we learned was that 100% of those hospital systems and uh, public lab officials want or even are willing to explore working with a partner like us or even have started to think about building one themselves but there really isn't anything in the market today uh, that is delivering testing in this capability. So when we look into the uh, target market here, sorry, there's a little lag on my end. The numbers of patients are actually really strongly identified by kind of two different bucket areas. Uh, those that you would expect to be young, kind of in this age range of 15 to 25, and they represent approximately 50% of all STI cases. And then the other large bucket is seniors in age 65 plus. 
And so those are two very different types of users when you think about digital, when you think about testing and where do they want to test and how do we deliver testing capabilities to them. And so, of course, you know, when you think of youth, you think of mobile, digital, and definitely, you know, wanting to be self-led on that. And in seniors, you definitely also would want them to have some kind of privacy, but they want to potentially find a way to do this with newer technologies that their kids are telling them about. So it's very interesting to look that in these two different target markets anchored by uh, generational differences, that digital health and a very kind of private and, and easy to use platform was actually something that would be consistently used across the board. And you can see here real quickly in the small print that these are uh, these STIs are also prevalent across chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, HIV, and, and others. So this isn't really just focused on a single type. So when you look at what could iMoware bring to the solution then, it really was about bringing our testing capabilities, the digital integrations, reports, clinical action ability, an eightplex microarray test that's run at a CLIA CAP lab that supports 50 state testing. And that eightplex is really exciting because it basically looks at eight different infections from one sample type. And it's pretty advanced, relatively speaking, to some of the simpler modalities out there that might look at one or two on a PCR. And so you'd have to run that sample through multiple assays. And we've been able to test and confirm and validate that this sample, of course, is stable through transport, stable upon arrival, and then through to testing and resulting. And so iMore has partnered now with several commercial business partners, and we are just in the works with some IHNs, hospital systems, in the United States to roll these types of platforms out. So with that said, in working with Roche, what we wanted to do was to establish a way that we could take our digital know-how and the knowledge we had around STIs and the creation of this leading edge eightplex microarray test and work with Roche to bring it out through their technology, their network, their commercial operations. So we're very excited about where we think this can go. And we believe that this Creosphere relationship will actually resolve in moving forward with another 90 day exercise where we look to move forward and take this into actual commercial hands and help this get into the hands of patients. With that said, short and sweet, thank you very much. Thank you, Yanni and uh, Michael. Um, fingers crossed for the next, uh, well, big step and also for a uh, joint project that's coming out of that. Now, we're coming actually already to the last pitch of today. Um, and we're jumping into the situation I described before that you have a slightly tedious process to find an appointment with your doctor or ETC. The startup that we're seeing now and the, the collaboration that we're seeing now is, well, focusing to a certain extent on exactly that process, how to schedule a doctor's appointment. And we're working here with Doctina, the biggest provider across the Benelux countries. And with that, I'd like to welcome Alain and Luis to the virtual stage. At Roche Diagnostics, sitting in lovely Switzerland. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't, I could not make it in person, but I'm happy to be here virtually. So, as uh, as we were mentioning right before, uh, cervical cancer is a, a big, big public health concern. Every two minutes, a woman die across the globe from this terrible disease. And we at Roche, and also in collaboration with Doctena, are trying to do something about it to improve this uh, grim statistics. And we already have from Roche, we have a full portfolio of screening and diagnostic tests. And now we are currently developing a solution called Lavify Cervical Screening, which seeks to, seeks to maximize the life-saving impact of cervical cancer screening. And now in collaboration with Doctena, we're trying to gap, uh, build a grid uh, bridge to gap this connection between healthcare professionals and patients. And today we're gonna briefly guide you through what we've been working on in this past couple of months. Just a brief overview of what our solution is from the Rush side. Navifal cervical screening is a digital tool that is supposed uh, that is based on empowering healthcare systems 
to seamlessly manage and execute cervical cancer screening. We have two main components to the solution. We have uh, population analytics, which is a set of program KPI dashboards, uh, mainly targeted for public health institutions that are setting up cervical cancer screening programs in a way that they need to set up uh, key performance indicators and they need to be able to measure these to be able to improve their programs uh, and, and their healthcare spending. And on the other side, we have a whole platform called Patient Tracker, which supports inpatient and workflow management. With, this, with these two tools in, in, in place, we seek to uh, impact on our value pillars for the solutions, which are to have insights enabling early detection. We seek to also optimize time and resources of the healthcare professionals and healthcare authorities. We seek to have no patient left behind, seeing that right now one of the main issues and concerns from these public healthcare authorities is that women or patients get lost in the system. Sometimes patients come to a pap smear for an HPV screening, they have a positive result and they never come back to look for it, coming back a few years later with an advanced case of cancer. And last but not least, also to standardize patient care. So for the past couple of years, we've been developing the solution and we identified that there are some needs or some functionalities that we lack in order to really address these value pillars. And this is where Doctena comes in place. So I hand over to my colleague, Melanie Menkes from Doctena, so she can guide us through what Doctena is, so we can further explain about this collaboration of the two solutions. Thank you, Luis, and hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here. So I'm going to, in three minutes, quickly explain to you what Doctena is all about. Uh, so as you can see in this slide, our core business is to connect healthcare professionals and patients by enabling a hassle-free communication. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, we can all probably very easily relate to these problems. So on one hand, we have the healthcare professional dealing with a lot of admin work uh, and inefficiencies in their practice. For example, secretaries taking appointments and um, basically spending a lot of time in tasks that do not bring any big value or contribution. And on the other hand, we have the patient who struggles to get an appointment um, at any time of the day and that fits their needs uh, and their availabilities. So this is basically the process that we aim to solve. And if we move to the next slide, what we can basically hear uh, is how our business in connecting practitioners and patients has evolved all around Europe. So we are originally a company that was founded in uh, 2013. So this year is our 10 year anniversary in Luxembourg. Um, we're currently present in six countries and over 1.7 million appointments are booked every month via Doctena. We have over 100 medical specialties listed in our platform. 96% of satisfied, satisfied patients. So we are what we like to consider as a love brand because we really simplify the, the journey and the manual processes of appointment booking. And we have over 10,000 health professionals um, working in our platform. So moving on from these overall numbers and to explain you a bit more about what we offer, we basically enable online booking through a seamless and convenient experience. So basically, Every person by downloading an app or simply going into doctena.lu or BE or whichever country it is, um, they can basically look for the practitioner that they need to get an appointment with. And in only a few clicks, they can very easily schedule it. For the practitioner, we offer the best in class in the market online agenda so that they can customize it as needed and um, boost the efficiency of their practice. And then point number three is that we offer increased visibility and online reputation. So especially for young professionals who are starting their own practice um, with Doctena, they can very easily build their pool of patients. So to finalize, um, these are a couple of benefits uh, from the process that we enable and that again, with a partnership with Roche, we want to also enable for um, screening medical, um, sorry, screening the, the, the patients that are involved uh, in, the, in the new Roche uh, project. So basically we want to enable patients to book appointment 24 seven um, by having automated notifications. We reduce the no-shows, but up to 70% and we enable automated SMS and email notifications before and after the appointment, as well as a video consultation feature. So basically, by sending these reminders and recalls, we aim to help Roche to 
make the full process more efficient. For example, if a test is um, wrong, so basically there is a next step, we can very easily automate this step of the process so that the practitioner doesn't need to deal with contacting the patient, indicating the next steps or so. So basically we provide a much faster and um, simplified experience. So that was all from our side. Very quick introduction. Luis, I don't, want, I don't know if you want to add anything else from your side. Yes, thank you, Melanie. So when, when we started this project and we started talking with Doctena and recognized all these features that Doctena has, we said, this is what we need in our solution. And why reinvent the wheel where we can leverage and collaborate with a company like Doctena? So the solution that we are bringing is how can we integrate Doctena's patient scheduling and communication solutions with our Navify cervical screening solution. In this way, supporting this end-to-end -end patient management throughout the whole process of screening and diagnosis. So a few months ago, we set out to collaborate and, and, and the idea was to have a joint business and solution concept in which we were to have an as-is analysis of a patient flow and identify which areas can we collaborate in to have a joint solution value proposal and based on these to work on partnering models, uh, concepts and also technical integration concepts. How can we go to market together? How can we integrate both solutions? And just a brief snippet of what we have been doing and just a, a, a few snapshots of, of our work in these past couple of months, we mapped out the full patient journey. This is just a, por a portion of the patient journey. And we identified the areas in which Doctena can, we can leverage Doctena's capabilities during the process and Navify cervical screening within the process. And we see that it's throughout the process, we see interaction between the two solutions, uh, which made, makes it a perfect fit for, for this use case. And not only this, but we created a joint value proposition in which we put the four value pillars that we uh, talked about uh, earlier. And we identified where in these value pillars does the, does the different solutions and the different features of the solutions. I didn't want to go into much detail, but we see that Doctena has a great impact on at least two of the value pillars, optimizing time and resources, and also making sure that no patient is left behind by, with all of these that Melanie mentioned uh, right before. And we went a little step ahead and we validated this joint value offering with experts in the field of cervical screening in multiple countries in the region and in also some public healthcare uh, institutions around the globe. And this was a confirmed value proposition. There's a, there's a great interest to have something like this in the market. And actually it's some fun, like interesting fact is that we asked them to prioritize the different features without acknowledging like which is from Doctena, which is from Navifat cervical screening. And it was very uh, like, some of the some of our solutions were very, ranked very high by some specialists, some of Loctena features, so it's really complementary. And just to close off, so the outcomes of these past couple of months, we were able to, to have an externally validated joint uh, solution value proposal, and we found a product market fit, ident uh, we identified a product market fit specifically in the public healthcare sector, which is where we are seeing most opportunity for this collaboration, and we're going to continue uh, to explore. So as next steps, uh, following the initial outcomes of our first installations uh, in, the, in the next couple of months, we will reconvene and start working on the partnering and business model concepts and to start collaborating on these technical integration concepts. So just uh, that was all I had for today. And just to, as a final message, just thank you, Melanie, very much. And also Allah and everyone else in the Doctena team. And also thank you to everyone in the startup Priosphere and, and, and Roche for making this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much from our side as well. All right. So it is a wrap for the po uh, startup pitches. Thank you very much for all of your engagement, for all the collaborators, both on organizing, but also uh, in the execution of those collaborations. And a huge shout out to my team uh, that has been working here to make that happen. Also, especially on the venture side, uh, behind the scenes, Daria and Max, a uh, shout out to you. Um, I am not the last one that's in between you and the beers. So I will hand it over to Christina quickly and um, for the pilot pitches. And I saw you scanning the QR code all already. Before that, can we go back to the slides? Because I, of course, want you, want you to be ready for the rest of the evening. It's great to be back on stage uh, with all of you. You've been an amazing audience. We had a long afternoon, exciting pilot 
showcases, keynote speakers, insights from our corporate partners, and it's really been a blast uh, to be here on stage with all of you. of the time, so you will find me at the photo booth for sure. Um, so share your highlight of the day on LinkedIn. And now it's time to vote. So please scan the QR code. Um, we had 10 amazing pilot showcases. We have two minutes to vote. So now it's the chance to really vote for the one pilot project that impressed you most. A lot of people scanning the code, that's amazing. I'm very excited. Who will be the winner? And if the person, if the team is on site here with us, I will ask you to come on stage. So be ready. One last minute, we had three projects with Biotronic and seven with Roche. Who was your favorite team? It looks like one team is very much ahead, so submit your votes still. Um, votes are closed now, and I think the winner is still the same, Fabian? Yes, okay, perfect. Then I would ask the team um, with Roche and Sensoria on stage. Please come on stage. Congrats. Very well deserved. Congrats, you won the Best Pilot Showcase Award. And now, Hannah, you can start the confetti. One, two, three. Let's take another picture, our photographers here. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, congrats. Connect with the team um, of Sensoria and Roche. Very well deserved. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was the best pitch award. And um, yeah, with that, thank you everyone from my side for being such a great audience today. And now I'd, I would like to ask Federico Rohr again on stage for some closing um, remarks. Connect with all of us later on. 
And yeah, let's continue this spirit and have a good time, Federike. Thank you, Christina. And you can actually stay right on stage. And um, yeah, also from my side, thank you for the great afternoon, the great day, and for your patience. And now I'm the last person between you and the beer and the food. And um, we would like to thank you, Christina, for organizing this, and also ask Sabrina on stage um, for the great, great job of today's event. You can see all the little details. So big, big applause for Sabrina and Christina from all of us for organizing this. Very good. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, picture. Thank you. So you. <laughs> and then um, we would like to ask the entire Startup Creosphere team, and I hope you all know who that is, on stage for a picture. Um, so all of our partners, our batch startups, our team. So Jiskia, Christina, Fabian, will take a picture with all of us. Our partners, BIX, I see you right there. And our batch startups, please come on stage for a picture. All of the startup crews for your batch startups. So you see who's behind today's event.